Watch this. It's been a common practice at colleges and university for decades, but what exactly is tenure? Who gets it and why? More movement inside the Idaho State House, so with a little more than a month until lawmakers head back to Boise, who's in and who's out? They've served breakfast to locals and tourists for the past four decades, but this weekend, the McCall Pancake House will whip up and serve their final meals before shutting their doors one final time. Well, thanks for joining us here on your Friday on the 208. We've made it through the week. A major conversation this week centered on comments made by a Boise State professor, academic freedom, and the First Amendment. We dug into a lot of this this week on the 208. Boise State professor Dr. Scott Yenner drew local and national attention after his comments on feminism at a conference out of town recently. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But first, we wanted to circle back to a word that you might have heard a few times this week. And the word is tenure and tenure at a university by definition is the right to keep a job especially the job of being a professor at a college or university for as long as you want to have it there is of course not unique to boise state boise state has tenure just like almost every other university in our country and there's a process that academics go through to earn tenure and it's not as simple as just ticking off some requirements no a panel of academic peers as well as administrators they review several areas of consideration like performance in the classroom and research quality as well as conduct it's a big deal when an academic earns tenure you'll usually see a large party to celebrate the large accomplishment it's been pointed out this week that Dr. Yenner, he is tenured at Boise State, which some assumed meant that there are no rules that apply to Dr. Yenner. It's important for us to state this. That statement is not true. Tenure does not make someone exempt from school rules, policies, or the law. It does, however, protect people like college professors from certain consequences after publishing academic research or speaking at a conference, for example. This afternoon, I spoke with Boise State Provost John Buckwalter about tenure and the value of it at places like Boise State. And to be very clear here, the disclaimer, the conversation you're about to hear is speaking in general terms. Boise State tells us they cannot comment on personnel matters like calls for Dr. Yenner to be investigated for his comments on women and feminism. In terms of academic freedom and research, what do you think the benefits of tenure are in concert with that? I think it allows investigators to maybe approach topics um, that maybe they wouldn't approach before. And uh, people tend to concentrate on the controversial nature. But I, I think it's just as likely that um, you, you might decide you want to investigate something that's not quite as much of a sure thing, so to speak, that you're not quite sure what you're going to find out when you run those experiments. And if you end up with um, a whole lot of nothing, the penalty for that as a junior investigator can be much more severe than uh, a, um, a more senior uh, investigator because their more senior investigator already has built their academic re reputation within the scientific community. And so they don't, they, they can, they can afford um, some things that don't work out in ways that maybe junior investigators can't. Tenure doesn't provide uh, any faculty member at Boise State or any other institution around the country just carte blanche to do whatever they want. Um, there are, you know, certainly um, examples um, at other uh, institutions. I think uh, if you go to the Chronicle of Art Education, you can see an institution in Florida, I think, that just uh, let a, uh, some tenured faculty go for a variety of reasons. Reasons. And so I think this, there is a misconception that just because you're tenured that um, you can do whatever you want. And that's certainly not true. Uh, what do you think the value of tenure is? Well, I, I think um, one of the things you have to, to recognize, it's sort of an industry standard at this point. And so when you, um, when you think of a university, um, tenure is something that um, is a pretty standard accepted practice. And so I think if you were to approach it where you didn't have tenure, you would probably um, have a much more difficult time recruiting top talent to uh, a place like Boise State if, if you didn't have tenure. And so from that aspect, I think it's a, um, a, a, a recruitment and retention tool. 
A lot of conversation in our community about this. Many wondering if Dr. Yenner is now under investigation by Boise State or an independent investigator or if he's immune from that because of tenure. You're not immune from things because you have tenure, as we just talked about. But in terms of questions about an investigation at Boise State, here's what we can say to answer that. We really don't know because, again, Boise State tells us they cannot comment on issues like this because it is a personnel matter. They do tell us, though, in a statement, quote, that the university takes allegations of policy violations seriously and investigates them under the appropriate policy. So an investigation into a tenured professor, hypothetically, is a very involved process, according to the provost, Buckwalter, who you just heard from. And they take that issue, like academic freedom and having conversations in the classroom, as well as the First Amendment, they take all of that very seriously. So if you are watching closely to see something develop very soon, you may be disappointed. This is going to be a watch and wait situation as the significant process does happen or does not happen, depending on the personnel matter. Well, a big crowd is expected at Boise State tomorrow for a demonstration entitled Women Belong Everywhere. A group of local women quickly organized a show of support after the comments from Dr. Yenner went viral, which you will hear those in a few moments. But the women I spoke with who organized the event tell me that it's important for them to speak up and speak out against messages that they feel are demeaning women and their value. They tell me that this isn't about reacting to a run of the mill put down against an entire gender. They say this is about making a statement on a commentary that is damaging to women, especially young women trying to find their place in the world on their terms. In response to comments made by a Boise State professor about the role of women in society. They are more medicated, meddlesome, and quarrelsome than women need to be. Idaho women say they are coming together to prove a point. All women belong in their chosen careers. In the year 2021, it's really troubling that I have to defend myself as a human being, right? Like, I have to remind people that women actually have access and the same rights as anyone else. So it is, it's kind of, it is more than troubling for sure. And I thought the conversation was interesting. Melissa Wintrow is an Idaho State Senator who has also taught gender studies at Boise State since the early 2000s. She says there is, of course, value in provocative conversations, but that recent words from Dr. Scott Yenner are not that. Every effort must be, must be made not to recruit women into engineering, but rather to recruit and demand more of men who become engineers. Ditto for med school and the law and every trade. You know, he goes beyond just having a provocative conversation about gender roles. He says you don't belong and that you belong somewhere else, right? So he says you, you, we should be discouraging women from getting their education and being in the workforce. He doesn't just talk about it in some, you know, uh, generic sense. He's actually saying we shouldn't do it. We have an obligation to ensure that women are present, and, and that's what this is all about. Brooke Green is an Idaho lawmaker and a Boise State graduate now working in STEM. As a lawmaker, she hears a lot of things that draw her attention, but Green says she felt compelled to speak out when she heard Yenner's comments. I'm a transportation planner. I plan and help my female engineers build our roads. And so when he makes the statement that we are not to be promoting women into these roles, it is personal because I too sit at that table with all my women colleagues, all my male colleagues, and we work together. And so that is how it became so personal. And I remember staying late up at night and I was like, what can we do to create a presence in our community and to elevate women of all of these professions and, and give them an opportunity to be presence. So Green went back to Yenner's words to help create what she hopes is a meaningful statement. I listened to his whole 20 minute speech and it was a comment at the very end um, where he states, men should be public and women should be private. The effort to erase the old standard of public men and private women has been a mistake. I would challenge him in that, you know, there's less to lose and more to gain. You know, when we have diversity at the table and everybody belongs, where everybody has access to be who they are, we're gonna have a much better world. And so I would ask him to put down his weapons <laughs> and to take his blinders off and really see the world for what it is and allow people to be who they want. So Wintro, Green, and many others are making a statement Saturday at Boise State. There is nothing more public than the event we're doing on Saturday where we can promote women to be present. And that, that is the whole uh, 
you know, that is really the catalyst behind it. So it's those last few words, because there's nothing about putting us, you know, quietly on the back burner in our professions and in our lives as that state was. If every Nobel Prize winner is a man, that's not a failure. It's kind of a cause for celebration. I would say, you know, to women that hear those words, young women, you know better. You are valuable human beings and you should not be, uh, you know, confined to any man's perspective of who you are. Um, pursue your happiness, uh, follow your dreams, you know, uh, connect with your gut feelings uh, and, and seek out women mentors and, and do not internalize that kind of garbage. I reached out to Dr. Yenner this week for a comment or to have a conversation about this topic. He did not respond to my email. The event tomorrow at Boise State is scheduled for 1130 in the morning. Well, a lot of inside movement at the State House. Even more today, Governor Brad Little has appointed Representative Muffy Davis of Ketchum to now the Blaine County Commission. And Davis, who currently is serving her second term, represents District 26. That's Blaine, Lincoln, Camas, and Gooding Counties. She will now be replaced by current board member Jacob Greenberg, who is leaving the board. She will serve out, though, the remainder of her term through January 2023. Davis is a Paralympic athlete and has won seven medals in alpine skiing and cycling, including a gold medal in the 2012 London Games at the team relay. The Blaine County Board of Commissioners will now have two gold medal winning Olympians on the board. How about this? Davis joins current board chairman Dick Fosbury, who won gold in the 1968 Mexico City Olympic Games as a high jumper, also innovated the high, the, the high flying Fosbury flop, I should say. Now, Governor Little will appoint her replacement before the start of the session on January 10th. There has already been a lot of movement within the state house in the off season, so to speak, the short off season, I should say. Senator Ali Robbie of Boise resigned after she moved out of her district, so Governor Little appointed Carrie Semmelroth to take her seat. Senator Steve Baer of Blackfoot is also stepping down for family reasons, and former state representative Julie Van Orden will fill in for him this upcoming session. It's been a busy few days for our inbox. We've gotten a lot of questions about things that have piqued your interest this week, so we're answering them today, coming up. Doesn't matter the time of day, feel free to text us your questions about anything. Well, almost anything. Just make sure they're relevant to Idaho, right? If you don't already, here's our number, 208-321-5614. As always, make sure to include your name and hashtag the 208. We're going to share as many of these messages as we can at the end of our show. Well, a big update for you if you haven't looked at your phone or calendar today. It's Friday, which means two things. We're about 15 minutes away from starting our weekend. But before we do that, 
We want to make sure we're answering some of the questions that you so nicely sent to us over the last few days, like one that was brought up after yesterday's update on the crutch shortage that several of our medical facilities continue to face. And after Primary Health put a call out for help, the community donated more than 100 pairs of crutches in just a few weeks, and they're badly needed right now. But that led to this question from Matthew on the 208 Facebook page saying, quote, are these crutches that people are donating being donated to the patients or does the patient pay for them? Good question. The answer is no. Primary Health says that after they're all sanitized and distributed to their clinics, which will happen within the next week or so, they will be provided to patients who need them at no cost. So it goes full circle, pay it forward there. All right, another question for you. Alan emailed us earlier this week and asked, what KT, would KTVB happen to know why glowing lights have been out at the river sculpture at the Grove Hotel? This is a really good question and an eagle-eyed viewer noticed. So if you're new in the area, we're talking about a specific piece of art in downtown Boise. We're going to show it to you here right now. It's pretty hard to miss if you're ever downtown. It's right on the corner of Capitol and Front Streets, scaling 50 feet high on the facade of the Grove Hotel. This is called the River Sculpture. This is actually when it was being built back in the old days. It was installed in 1999. It's meant to serve as a celebration of water, and there it is as it was being built. If you go downtown, it's hard to miss. Now, at one point, it was pretty interactive, but mist and fog would flow from the cracks and crevices at night. It would all be illuminated by neon light, but because of ongoing water damage, the fog and the mist display has since been turned off. What about the lights? Well, the Boise Department of Arts and History said that the sculpture is on, but before this morning, it hasn't yet been adjusted for the time change. Remember, we fell back a few weeks ago, so that changed today. So if you're going to go downtown tonight, it should be back and up and running by tonight, except for the very top of the sculpture where the light is currently burnt out. But we are told they are going to get that repaired. It's on their list. The long wait times on the weekends worth the giant cinnamon rolls. But after 43 years, this iconic breakfast spot in McCall will soon be no more. We know you want to get one final fix in, but don't hit the road just yet. They don't open until 7 a.m. So until then, enjoy the rest of the show with us, and you might as well send us a text message with your comments, maybe your memories about the Pancake House. Here's the number. 208-321-5614. Please make sure to include your name and hashtag the 208. We're going to share some of your texts on air at the end of the show, so keep them coming.
One thing that you need to know, there is a dense fog advisory that's in this uh, blue area right through here for Boise. Of course, they've had some pretty heavy fog in some spots to the west end of the valley, especially even Eagles had some of that. It's a possibility again tonight. That's from 11 o'clock this evening to 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. And then the advisory still continues around the area for poor air quality, but that could change by the time we get into Sunday. Now let's talk about the fog. Already you can see Boise's gone down to seven miles an hour. Visibility very low in Ontario, Caldwell and Nampa. So it's already there. It's better, of course, over here in Twin Falls and Jerome, where the air quality happens to be good. Now, the temperature today was up to 53 degrees, 40 degrees for Caldwell. See, the fog in the early morning has kept those temperatures down. It's expected to do the very same thing for tomorrow. So here's a look at your weekend. We have a cold front coming through later that night, but we're still going to get up uh, to about 55, 56 degrees. That's for tomorrow. And then as we get into Sunday, uh, you're going to notice here that it's going to be cooler. Uh, there's a slight chance of a shower in the morning, but we're not going to see much. You might even see some snow in the morning, changing the rain on Monday. OK, another storm system comes in on Wednesday. Uh, snow in the morning, changing the rain, but I think it's snow. Not a lot, but the end of the storm into Thursday, scattered snow showers for Friday with a low temperature down to 19. Ooh, there's some cold conditions coming up. My Monday morning is probably I'm going to probably roll over and get a couple of more hours sleep than I normally do. For the first time in more than 40 years, George and Bonnie Bertram won't have to get up before the sun to go work at the pancake house in McCall. No more restocking coffee mugs or putting that parsley garnish on the massive plates coming out of the kitchen because on Sunday, it will be the last dance, the last day for the pancake house there in McCall and, and the Bertrams will actually begin their retirement. So congratulations on the retirement. But they announced that this week they have finally sold the building in McCall after four years of it being on the market. But the new owners, they tell us, will not be keeping the kitchen. In fact, they tell us it won't be a restaurant at all. Much to the disappointment of George and Bonnie. They say they tried, but nobody wanted to keep it going as a restaurant. 43 years ago, they took over the Pancake House. What was once a literal house located right along Highway 55 as you drive north into McCall. And for nearly two decades, they served countless customers from those cramped quarters. In 2002, they opened the 11,000 square foot log cabin lodge style, complete with six grills and enough to seat more than 200 people. And there were still lines out the doors most weekends, likely to get a taste of their pigs in a blanket, their plate sized pancakes or even bigger, the all time great cinnamon rolls. George and Bonnie haven't just been the owners of the pancake house these four decades. Every day, aside from a few vacations here and there, George and Bonnie were either out on the floor or in the kitchen working right alongside their employees. Bonnie tells us that the roster of current and former staff members runs to near 400 over the years, with some of them sticking around almost as long as they have. The Bertrams say that their pancake house family will be what they will miss most about not showing up for work on Monday. They've worked here for so many years that they're like, you know, you, you get used to seeing them in the morning and then you won't see them anymore. Ready for retirement. Yeah. Yeah. We're old. You know, we're both in our 70s. When you get to that point, you kind of realize that the days are numbered and there's still things you want to do in life. And now we, we're, we're going to get a chance to do that, hopefully. And they will also miss the faithful customer, some of who have been patrons for generations. Oh goodness, As for those nice things they don't want to do, first on the list is to spend some time traveling to visit some family scattered across the country. They can't wait to do that. Something they feel they've neglected over the years. Brian Holmes and photojournalist Kevin Esslinger, they actually spent the entire morning in McCall today, and they're going to tell us more about the closing of this McCall icon coming up on Monday. So join us on Monday for a special feature on the 208.
Here's a reminder, you can watch every single episode in its entirety on the 208 on YouTube. So never worry about missing a show or forgetting to set your DVR. Just go search KTVB7 after every show and boom, we're right there in full color in live action. Well, not live action because it's a recorded show. All right, let's get to some of these comments here. This one from Steve. Too bad to see the pancake house go away. Someone needs to step up and buy it to keep the best place to eat in McCall open. Unfortunately, Steve, they tried to do that. Didn't quite work out. A lot of people sad to see it go, but it will not be a restaurant anymore. Um, this person says the best. So sad they are leaving. Hashtag the 208. Look how big the cinnamon roll is. I know it's television. It, the scale might not work, but I saw it. It's bigger than my head. And there's a joke in there somewhere, but please don't make it. This person says, I'm on my way to camp out at the Pancake House tonight. I'm not missing out on getting one last meal. Thank you, James, for sending that one. Final one, uh, when is the last day for the Pancake House in McCall? It is iconic. Sunday is the last day, so get up there and plan for a little bit of traffic. But an all-time classic in McCall is saying goodbye on Sunday. Everyone have a great weekend. We'll see you Monday.